2 Corinthians 12, 6, starting in the New Living Translation says, If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so, because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelation from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Is there anybody that can relate to that? Can, can, can anybody in this place relate that, that there are some things that feel like they are plaguing my life and I, I keep praying for God to take it away? I'm, I, I'm not sure why he won't do it and I'm not certain if he's going to do it, but, but I continue to pray nonetheless. I, I don't stop my prayers just because my prayers are not manifesting everything that I want them to. Because it's his will, not my will. Paul says, Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Kingdom, culture, culture yes. God is. Allow me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, we trust you. God, we trust you now more than we ever have before. And we trust you now more than we have before because... You've been good all the days of our lives. We, we trust you now more than we have before because you have proven that you can do anything except fail. Father God, I want to encourage the hearts of your people that are in this place today. Encouraging the hearts of people that things are not happening the way they predicted that they would. Encouraging the hearts of your people that sit on the brink of fear, uncertainty, difficulty, challenges, praying for your people that are experiencing loss in this season. Father God, we are asking right now that you would show up in this place, that I would decrease and you would increase. Touch my mouth, place your words in it as you did with your prophet Jeremiah, that what is declared in this place called NTC but bring glory to your name and edify your body. Allow your Holy Spirit to translate my words from my mouth to the hearts and the ears of your people, that they would not merely hear what I'm saying, but that they would hear what it is you're saying. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you will, last week we embarked upon the exploration and explanation of a thorn. Paul, in this second letter to Corinth, was defending his dedication to Christ. As Paul communicates his commitment to Christ, flexing his faith through the fiery trials and tribulation, Paul conveys his commitment not by what he has been victim to, but by what he's remained faithful through. See, if you recall and you were here last week, we, we talked about the fact that in chapter 11, Paul began to make a distinction between him and these would-be apostles, these Judaizers who seemed to find pleasure in undoing the mission and the ministry that Paul was embarking upon. And so what he began to make a distinction on is he would say, they've not served as much as I've served. They, they have not been in prison as many times as I have been in prison. I've been whipped so many times that you couldn't count the number of times that I've been beaten. And it was there that I explained to you that Paul was not trying to tell us what he had been victim to, but instead he was communicating what he has remained faithful through. See, if you recall, it was here that we learned that through Paul that faithfulness is a flex. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know everybody won't clap on that because we have 
found such solace in running from our issues. For whatever reason, we have been convinced that if you don't like a thing, you merely walk away from a thing. There are some of us, though, that keep a cadence of consistency. We are not in and out. We are not up and down. If we are with you, then we are with you until the end. If you're my friend, I'm your friend in good times and in bad times. When I serve God, I serve God when it feels good. I serve God when it does not. Because faithfulness is a flex. Faithfulness, fa faithfulness is a flex. I, I don't change sides because of the pressure of the pain. So, so Paul, Paul conveys a level of loyalty to Christ that even when there are problems, pain, and even prison, Paul was faithful. Yeah, I, I believe that Paul's perspective was indicative of what we learned from Jesus. I share with you that Jesus was explaining the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, where it says the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit is produced. If you recall, it was right here that I explained to you a point that if you can't be faithful, you'll never be fruitful. If you, if you can't be faithful, you can't be fruitful. See, Paul's position is the same position that Jesus took in the scripture, that if you can't be faithful, you'll never be fruitful. That if, when the going gets tough, you bow out and quit. If when you're faced with challenges, you become fearful and you forfeit, you'll never be able to manifest the glory of God that he is placing within you. And so some of us have to learn to remain faithful in order to be fruitful. See, people have to understand that your growth is dependent on your commitment and consistency. That means that you keep trying even when it hasn't happened yet. It means you keep going even when you're exhausted in it. That you serve when it's fun and you serve when it's frustrating. That you keep communicating even when it's hard to do. You maintain hope even when things feel hopeless because if you can't be faithful, you can't be fruitful. This is just recap. Tell somebody this is recap. Yeah, yeah, see, his faithfulness, him, him being consistent, even when it's chaotic, allowed for God to provide him with unprecedented revelation. Paul describes seeing and experiencing the third heaven, which I explained to you was the throne of God. Paul, Paul saw and experienced things that you and I could only dream of. Paul alleges that he was called up to the throne of God. That's when I said that revelation comes with irritation. Yeah, I know, it don't feel good, but, but revelation, revelation is when God is showing you what others have not seen. When, when God is allowing you and teaching you what others have not learned, when God speaks to you in ways that he is not speaking to other people, that is revelation. And it's important for you and I to know that revelation is rare. We know a lot of people that have a lot of information, but we don't always know people that have information that comes directly from God. And so revelation Revelation is rare, and revelation being rare makes it powerful. And as a result of this power, Paul is given some irritation to accompany his revelation because to whom much is given, much is required. All right, now, Paul, Paul, Paul is therefore given a thorn in the flesh. Now, I, I, I defined a thorn as something personal and painful that God repurposes to prevent pride. Yep, yep, I explained to you that the thorn that is being described in the scripture is a metaphor or a figure of speech, something that represents something else. And I told you this week I intend to tell you what God told me to tell you that the thorn is. But before we get there, I wanna go through some thorn theories. Look at somebody and say, thorn theories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before we get there, Paul, see, see, for Paul, he talks about this thorn. And therefore, you know how it is. What people don't know, they make up. Yeah, uh-huh. Yep, that's what they do. When they don't know, they make up stuff. You, 
And so people have speculated about the thorn. The Bible does not say what the thorn was, but there are those who have speculated on what I call thorn theories. Yep. Some speculate that the thorn was a carnal desire, that perhaps Paul was struggling with an intense bodily temptation. Now, the challenge there is that is highly unlikely, seeing as how Paul doesn't allude in Scripture to struggling with any type of bodily temptation. Yeah, so you have to understand the Paul that you and I study in Scripture didn't have any problem talking to you about the challenges that he had. If you remember, it was Paul that says the good that I desire to do is not the good that I do. It was Paul who had the outward willingness to be transparent and say, I die daily. And so this notion of a carnal desire, this bodily temptation doesn't stand up because there is nothing in scripture that substantiates the fact that Paul had this as a struggle. Thorn theories. Some propose that it might have been physical, that, that, that because of Paul's experience on the road to Damascus that he may have had a degenerative eye disease. Yeah, yeah, that, that he may have struggled with something like glaucoma or ophthalmia. See, other ailments were also mentioned, things like epilepsy or malaria, which was common in his time. This speculation is supported due to his letters to Galatia. As he spoke about being sick in chapter 4, verse 13, of Galatians, and even conveyed in verse 15 of chapter 4 of Galatians, that they would have given him their eyes if they could. Yep, thorn, thorn theories. Others, however, speculate that it was probably people. Yeah, some of y'all can relate to that. Yeah, say, I don't need no substantiation for that, Pastor. I, uh, I'm dealing with those thorns right now. Others, others speculate that it might have been people, that, that, that there were a group of individuals that Whenever Paul would come through a region, they would come behind Paul through the region in an effort to undo everything that it was he was doing. They would preach a gospel that was different than the gospel that Paul was preaching. And so Paul had some active opposition to his message and his mission. I will share with you um, that there was a Scottish commentator that even proposed that Paul's thorn might have been his wife. Hey, baby. <laughs> Paul. There was a Scottish commentator that proposed that Paul's thorn may have even been his wife which probably tells us far more about this Scottish commentator's marital issues than their theology, because if you know the Paul that I know, Paul was never married. And so, so yet in the scripture, as Paul writes, he says, even though I've received such wonderful revelation from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. And so I share with you these thorn theories because what the thorn was is not clear. But what is clear is that this thorn, whatever it was, appeared to drain Paul of his strength. See, in that you and I can relate. See, whatever, whatever this thorn was, it seemed to, as the King James Version describes, buffet, which buffet means to punch down against. Yeah, so whatever this was, it began punching against Paul's progress. But what was wonderful is it wasn't only punching against his progress, but it was also punching against his pride. And so it was after careful consideration and significant study 
that I believe that I arrived at what some of the greatest theological minds might have missed. Yeah, after spending some time in the text and much prayer with God, I'm confident that God gave me what to tell you about Paul's thorn. And so what Paul's thorn was is. If you're ready, say I'm ready. ready. See, this is going to come as a surprise to some of you, but for some of you, it's not going to be a surprise. What Paul's thorn was is none of your business. (laughs) Yup. Can I tell you that his thorn, what it was that he was struggling with, was none of our business? See, and the reason I say that is because sometimes we give more attention to what the Bible does not say instead of being focused on being faithful to what the Bible does say. I can't tell you how frustrated I get when I run into people that ain't even Christians at all. They don't follow Jesus, but they want to debate with me about the books that are not in the Bible. Have you ever have you ever talked to people like that? You want to tell me about the books that are missing and you ain't never read the 66 that you could get your hands on. This, 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 this thorn ain't none of your business. You, you want to know. And I know why you want to know. You want to know because you're nosy. That's you. You want to know because you want to be able to disqualify Paul and elevate yourself. Oh my goodness, can I tell you something? What was wonderful about what Paul did is Paul uses a metaphor that is universally inclusive language. Because while you and I don't know nothing about orthomnia, while we may not be able to spell the word, least of all understand what it does to you. Me and you may not have experienced glaucoma. We may have never had malaria. We may not have any type of degenerative eye disease. But one thing that all of us in this room can relate to is what it might feel like for you to have a thorn. Yeah. So God wanted me to tell you, stop searching for what Paul's thorn was. Because whatever it was that Paul was dealing with was painful enough that he decided to go to God. And if you were with me last week, I explained to you, I don't believe Paul to be the type of person that just said a simple prayer like you and I would. Lord, please take this thorn away in Jesus name. Amen. All right, y'all, let's eat. I believe that when Paul talks about praying when he talks about begging that it was a campaign that the Paul that I read about in scripture would have fasted about it he would have sacrificed for it he would have put some things down that he normally would enjoy in order to make sure that God was able to hear him purely that there would be no barrier between him and the obstacle that he's trying to get God to intervene regarding and so when he says that I pray will you put it up on the screen He says three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. Now, what's interesting is that as good of a God as we serve, that when Paul goes on these campaigns to have the thorn removed, he does not get the answer he wanted, but he always gets an answer. And so what I encourage you to do that as opposed to identifying the thorn that belongs to somebody else. Oh, you didn't think I was going to go there? See, you got to understand me and you can put Paul down for a minute. How about we start talking about the thorns of the people that are in your life on a regular basis? How about we talk about the criticism that you have for other people all the time? People that you identify as being lower than you. People that struggle with things that you don't struggle with. See, I believe that God is so strategic that he didn't allow you and I to know what Paul was dealing with because he knows that human nature allows us to 
discount ourselves from trouble because we're not dealing with what other people are dealing with. And so it's easy for us to stand on a soapbox when we are not experiencing carnal desires like homosexuality. It's easy for you to stand on a soapbox when you're not experiencing the same carnal desires as other people. See, you could talk about people being gluttonous when you have a level of self-control over what it is you eat. But I promise you, if we spend enough time going down the lines of things that make us feel sinful and dirty, it won't take long for me to pull up on your street just a little bit. I don't know. Do you understand? You may not drink, but uh, you may not be smoking, but uh, I can promise you, we, we take you give me a little time. I'll poke you where it hurts. We'll begin thumbing through your thorns, identifying the issues that you have that other people don't have. And so God is such a good God that he gives Paul the inspiration to use universally inclusive language in an effort to make sure that you and I don't become fixated on whatever issue Paul has that allows us to be blinded from the issues that you and I should be praying about. Because there's some things in your life that if we're honest are indeed thorns, but you ain't praying for God to take them away. Oh, you want to be honest or not really? Some of us have decided to make friends with our thorn. We've become closer to our thorn than our faithfulness. And so our thorn don't hurt until after we've indulged. Three times it says, I beg the Lord to take it away. So as opposed to us being fixated on Paul's thorn, what we should be fixated on is what Paul did in his faithfulness to connect to God about what his problem was. And so I have a question for you. What is your thorn? See, because the same way that you were waiting in anticipation for me to project up on this screen, what it was that Paul was struggling with. Are you equally as eager for me to put your name? Would you be as in anticipation if I put your picture of you in the action? What is your thorn? What is it that you are wrestling with that you don't like, that you don't prefer, but that God has prescribed in order to prevent you from being prideful. Because if we are honest, the things that we wrestle with are intended to remind us that we need God in order to overcome. The problem is when we assess the lives of other people, we don't automatically think of our thorns. Because if I thought about my thorn when I was identifying your thorn, I might say, Lord, remove this thing from me. And Sister Sandy, Lord, I noticed that she was struggling with. Brother Brad is having a hard time with, and I know their thorn is like my thorn. And instead of us praying about how to relieve their pain, we impress our finger on what hurts on them. We push them down in order to elevate ourselves as if we don't need everybody in the community of faith to be healed and healthy and whole. And so I ask you, what is your thorn? Now, I want to tell you... Um, that one of the things that I, I, I did last week, my wife and I, we were talking um, at, at lunch and we were talking about thorns and I was preparing, you know, for, for last week's message and um, she began to talk to me about thorns on plants because her mind works different than my mind works. 
And so I want to share with you guys what it was that she showed me about thorns, because sometimes when we think about thorns, we only think of the bad. We don't identify the good. See, if I can show you that the purpose of a thorn. See, the reason why plants have thorns is to prevent herbivores. That's animals that eat plants from eating the leaves. This is the part that I like, though. Eating the leaves that the plant puts so much energy into making. Oh, my goodness. I'm not going to go too far because I, I got something for you next week. But I need you. I need you to understand that when we think about thorns, thorns are not merely something that just makes me uncomfortable and makes me feel imperfect. But your thorn is the thing that protects the progress that God is making in your life. You don't go through all the struggles you've gone through, get the experiences that you got only to forfeit it because you're so pumped up and prideful about yourself. God says, I'm protecting the progress that I've placed within you by giving you a thorn. Because believe it or not, there are things that want to devour the progress I'm making in your life. That, that there is growth that is happening in you. That if you cannot protect yourself from pride, you will throw it all away. Because the devil knows that pride comes before the fall. Pride comes before destruction. And so God is so gracious. God is so merciful that he decided to embed something in our lives to keep us from believing our own hype. Because if we're not careful, we will begin to look at the things that we overcame, the successes that we have, the obstacles we've overcome, and we will forget the fact that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, And so it's important for you to know and understand that the purpose of a thorn is to protect. Can I give you this last thing? You've got to shift your mind frame and begin realizing that the thorns that you're dealing with, the problems in your life, I need you to begin seeing that your problem is your protection. That, that your problem, that the things that show up in your life that you don't have any power over. See, it's important for you to understand. I told you, we will spend our time trying to identify what the Bible does not say instead of becoming faithful over the things it does say. You trying to figure out the Greek and the Hebrew. There's some things in plain old English in there that we ain't. Huh? You don't need a translator for that. <laughs> so instead of trying to find ourselves by what the Bible doesn't say, it's important for us to become friends and scoot a little closer to the things the Bible does say. And so what we do know about Paul's thorn is that it was given. We do know that it was given in order to prevent pride. And in that, it keeps you connected to the source of your strength by reminding you of your weakness. And anything that draws us closer to God is not merely a problem, but it is also protection. And so what I encourage you to do this week because next week what I want to do is I want to explore the origin of the thorn. I want to spend some time with you in Genesis. I'll give you a heads up. I want to spend some time with you in Genesis identifying when the thorn was originally prescribed to humanity. See, because if you recall, Everything was wonderful until we decided that the enemy's voice 
was more substantial than God's voice. And the enemy convinced us that if we ate that which God told us not to eat, that we would be more like God than we already were. It was on the heels of our own sin that God declared thorns and thistles. And so I, I, want, I want you to come back next week so that we can spend some time identifying the origin. How did we get in a place where it was necessary for us to have a thorn in the first place? Because I assure you, you wouldn't have nah thorn. Nah, that's not. That's not grammatically correct. It's bad speech, good preach. I love y'all. You would not have a thorn if there was not a need for it. And so as opposed to going through your life and the challenges that you're experiencing, finding a reason to be disgruntled and discouraged about the fact that you got opposition. I need you to learn that your problem is your protection and that there are things on this journey that God puts in place to make sure that you don't become so full of yourself that you forget that you need him. Will you stand with me? God bless you. God bless you. Will you stand with me? I want to take a moment right here because I do not assume that because you came today or because you're watching online that it means that you are in right relationship with Christ Jesus. And so here at NTC, I explain that receiving the salvation of Jesus Christ is as simple as ABC. A is admit, B is believe, and C is confess. Here at NTC, we, pray, we say the prayer of salvation collectively so that if there is anybody under the sound of my voice that has never said it before, that you will know that there is nothing wrong with you, you are not isolated, but that you are, all, you are joining a larger family in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? And so if you're willing, I ask that you will repeat after me. Will you say, I admit, I admit that I have sinned, I have sinned and, I'm and I'm in need of a Savior. Of a savior. I, believe I believe Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is, the God, is the Son of God, that he died for my sins, and was resurrected with all power in his hands. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Put your hands together for somebody that may have said it for the first time. Will you have a seat, please? Listen, I have a few brief.